How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the show. This is Racing on the Rocks. My name is Jesse Williams, and uh, I think you guys are really going to enjoy today's podcast. Uh, But before we get there, I want to give a shout out to my friends at Infinite Off Road. Infinite Off Road is a small business owned by a good friend of mine, Mike. Uh, I've dealt with Mike for a long time. Uh, Mike's actually helped me build my Razor buggy, and uh, I was actually one of Mike's very first customers. I got a 50 inch light bar from him back in 2013 and uh, haven't looked back from there. Uh, I can personally attest to the customer service that Mike and his team offer. Specifically today, however, I'd like to talk about their Color Change Rock Light Kit. It's totally unmatched on the market. With a plug-and-play design, Infinite Off-Road offers the toughest and most durable Rock Light Kit on the market. They own the industry's first red, green, blue, and white light kit, which includes a pure white emitter all on its own. Controlled by Bluetooth or a handheld remote, Infinite Off-Road will keep your full-size or side-by-side rig riding deep into the darkest nights. Okay, perfect. Got that out of the way. Today we're talking to James Cantrell. If you don't know James Cantrell or that name doesn't ring a bell, he is the driver of the Mad Ram 11 Razor. Uh, James is just an awesome guy and I had a really good time talking to him today. He he really exemplifies what it means to be a driver as far as being thorough with your vehicle, uh, just knowing your stuff and, and, and being at all the races. Um, <laughs> James just got back from King of Hammers and we're going to talk about that today. Um, but I also just want to point out that uh, James's co-driver at King of Hammers is uh, Cole Shirley, if you don't know, and he is actually Mad Ram 11 himself. So, I think you guys are going to enjoy it. We talk about a bunch of different topics today, and we learn about how he got his start in the off-road world. So, without further ado, let's roll it out. Get a drink and gather around. Let's talk drivers. Let's talk rigs. Let's talk skill. You've got the best of the best in the off-road racing world. Have a seat at the table with us, and let's talk about racing on the rocks. How you doing, James? Pretty good, buddy. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. I uh, I have been really excited to talk to you. So you are actually someone uh, who I've watched for a really long time. I feel like you've been around the sport for a while. How long have you been doing this? Uh, this will be our eighth year actually racing. Eighth year racing. Now, how'd you get started in uh, trail riding and getting into the buggies and everything? I got started um, actually back in high school. Uh, me and my buddies, we found out about a local competition. It was actually the first year of the old E-Rock stuff. Oh, yeah. And uh, we went down to Jellico and hung out for the weekend and watched it and uh, fell in love with it instantly. That's cool. And so was, what was your first rig? Uh, my first rig was actually a CJ7. It was an 85 nice. CJ7. Yeah. How did, uh, what, what, what did it end up like? Uh, it ended up with a 4-liter AW4, Dana 44s, 37 MTRs, um, fully built, and actually I had it done for about eight months and had a rollover and fire and burnt the whole rig to the ground and complete loss. Yeah, I uh, I know that feeling. Uh, my, one, some of my buddies listening, they'll, they'll get the shout out. Uh, a few years ago, we went to Wheeling in the Country for New Year's Eve and uh, one of my buddies, his elbow hit uh, the ECU uh, in the razor and started it. Just started dumping fuel into. Uh, they had like one of those adjustable fuel gauge things and started dumping fuel in the engine and actually caught it and fire burned it to the ground. And the uh, worst part was actually it was his dad's razor. Um, so uh, I know that feeling. That's a that's a tough one to let go of, especially for your first rig. That's uh that's pretty rough. Yeah, um, it was kind of heartbreaking, you know. I mean put all the time and effort into it and then just watch it go up in flames but yeah. learn from the mistakes and move on yeah uh so what was what was the next thing you went into uh you know how soon after that jeep did you guys move into uh the racing that you do now um i ended up taking about six months off and actually had a good buddy of mine that had built a cj5 and uh he was actually moving to a different part of the country and was looking to unload it yeah so I ended up buying it, and um, Dirty Turtle, which is a local park here in Kentucky, um, was having a endurance race, sort of like King of the Hammers. Yeah. Um, it had just King of the Hammers had just started back then, and it was starting to gain popularity around the country a little bit. So they started uh, their own little endurance series, and we decided to sign up and go race it. So that's something I've noticed. Um, you know, not to get ahead of myself, but um, you seem to err more towards the endurance racing. 
Um, you did you did hill climbing in your bouncer, um, but you know what what drew you to start in endurance racing? Was it the only thing that they had going on, or what was it? Uh, the bouncing was really just taken off too. You know, I mean, Cole Shirley and Tim Cameron were posting all the videos, and that's another thing that got me into the bouncing stuff was watching the things that they did. Yeah. Um, I love the time, the seat time that you get in the endurance stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the rock bouncing, I look, it's just totally opposite adrenaline feel doing yeah. the bouncing than the endurance racing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, that's, that's, that's cool, man. Uh, so you guys, you got into that, uh, you know, what was the first rig that you, you guys got into and you were racing? Was it that, um, was it the next Jeep you had? Uh, the first rig we really raced seriously. We did two races in the CJ5, uh -huh. and uh, we actually went up to the Badlands to a qualifier Ooh. race they had for King of the Hammers. Yeah. And we realized real quick that leaf springs and two-inch up travel don't <laughs> work very well when you want to try to go fast. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a hard lesson to learn. I'm sure your body was pretty upset with you after that. Yeah, I spent three days at the chiropractor trying to get where I could walk again. We learned real quick that uh, good seats and safety equipment are really important when you want to go fast. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for, for those listening, you know, I, I actually got a chance to talk to uh, Hubert Rowland uh, yesterday, and we kind of went over on how you develop a race team, and, and it seems that, you know, racing is such a small percentage of what people who go off-roading, razors, you know, big full-size, um, but... Nine times out of ten, people think that whenever you want to build a race team, you have to have, you know, a million-dollar budget, and you have to have the top-of-the-line rig with the top parts. You know, how did you guys develop the whole idea of a race team and to where it's now where you guys are a legitimate race operation? It actually started, uh, me and my best friend, uh, Casey Ryan, went in together, and we built that Cherokee that we raced in, Ultra 4, 4500 class, okay. and Trek, and uh, another couple series. And that actually started uh, the main build of getting into it. We took a Cherokee that we bought for $300 that had a tree fall <laughs> on it, and put a cage in it, did some suspension work. Um, yeah. We got with some people out west that ran Jeep Speed stuff and yeah. bought a bunch of used parts. You know what I mean? We got on the website and found deals on stuff, yeah. bought a whole set of shocks for 500 bucks, like wow. stuff like that. You yeah. know what I mean? We uh, we made our budget work and got a car together that worked really well and we ended up being pretty successful with that Cherokee, winning a couple 4,500 class Ultra 4 races and a Trek Series championship and some other stuff with it. Yeah, so, you know, it started with you guys just kind of accumulating parts and, and having this vehicle that, you know, obviously everybody's rig gets a little bit better over time. You feel like, you know, you learn a bit, little bit more about what you like, how you want it to ride, stuff like that. Um, what was the, the factor for you that went from, you know, this is just me and my buddies throwing a rig together to, you know, this is, this is a race car and this is a, you know, full-fledged race operation. Well, we spent the first year kind of just playing around, hitting some races here and there, and then we got into, after we had some success, we got into the Ultra 4, opened up doing yeah. the Everyman Challenge stuff. Yeah. So once that came around, we started getting a little more serious about it once they opened the 4500 Pro class, and we decided to really put a full effort into it and see what we could do with it. Yeah, so that, that 4500, um, that's put on, if I'm not mistaken, by, uh, is it Four Wheel Parts or is it, was it Smitty Build? I don't remember who's... I who. think Four Wheel Parts is the presenting sponsor this year. It was that or Brannick Motorsports okay. was the presenting sponsor. I can't remember which one this year. Yeah, so when they say the Everyman Challenge, you know, I'm sure when it first started the requirements were a little bit more loose, but that, that whole idea of the Everyman Challenge, you know, I'm I'm not familiar with how you get into that. Uh, you know, do you just you know pay your registration fees, show up with a vehicle, and race that day and qualify to go through that process? What do you have to do? Yeah, the uh, Everyman Challenge is pretty much an open entry. Um, you, uh, Ultra Four has a list of the rules for the different classes. They've got the 4600 stock class, the 4500 mod class, and then they've also got the 4800 Legends class, mm -hmm. which all three run under the Everyman Challenge banner. Um, and you pretty much you build a car for the rules, show up, pay your money, and go race. There's no qualifying. There's no – you just show up and race. That's amazing. That's really cool. So anyone listening out there can pay their money, show up, and race. 
Yeah, and it's a great way to get out there and have fun without having to spend three hundred, three hundred fifty thousand dollars on a forty four hundred class car. Woo! <laughs> That's a bill right there. Yeah, the sport's <laughs> really progressed in the past couple of years since um, all the new IFS cars are coming out and all the yeah. new technology. They're starting to compete with trophy trucks as far as technology. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, before we get into too much of King of the Hammers, uh, I know that you did actually race uh, the bouncers for a while. Um, when you transitioned from going on the more Ultra 4 side to your bouncer, um, did you guys just completely cut out endurance racing for a little while and focus on the bouncer, or did you guys maintain both teams? Uh, we maintained both. We actually ran the same car doing the bouncer stuff and the stuff we did with the endurance racing. Yeah. Uh, we found that our suspension setup, we spent a lot of time getting the suspension dialed in with Phil Licardi out west. Okay. And we found out that once we got it working right, we could pretty much go do whatever we wanted with the car. You know, that's the that's the common pattern that I see. A lot of the times you'll have those east versus west shootouts, and, you know, I think that something that's really missed, especially in the side-by-side -side area, is, you know, just refactoring the things that are fundamental to your rig. Suspension, valving, you know, springs, everything like that. It's, it's not necessarily like a... Um, I want to say like a sexy upgrade, but it really makes a huge difference whenever you get into actually racing and actually wanting better performance out of your rig. Um, so when you say you got in there and, and, and altered the suspension and got that the way you wanted to, you know, what was, was there something that was like, wow, I didn't think it would be this way? Was it just trial and error that got you where you wanted to go? Or, you know, talk about that process. Uh, we went out to King of the Hammers with the rig after I bought it from uh, Mike Colville, who had raced it at King of the Hammers the previous year. Okay. And um, we wanted to play with the suspension a little bit. We liked the way it worked, but, you know, it can always be better when yeah. you're talking about suspension tuning. You Absolutely. cannot put enough time into shock tuning any vehicle that you're yeah. going to race. I mean, I personally think that's number one on the priority list of any vehicle right. besides safety. Um, we got we got hooked up with Phil, my buddy Joshua West, which owns Two Hundred and Eight Motorsports. Uh, he does all my tuning. Yeah. Uh, he hooked us up with uh, Phil Licardi uh, when okay. we were out at the Hammers, and we ended up going out in the desert with Phil, and we started playing with the shocks. And he made a couple uh, adjustments on the shocks and sent us out on a pass. And me and my Casey uh, looked at each other and we're like, "There's no way." Yeah. Like it went from being okay to being like, "Okay, we really got something now." Yeah. So what was the adjustment he made? Uh, he made some adjustments on the bypass tubes, and okay. he also made some valving changes on the front shocks and yeah. kind of opened them up a little bit. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. So would you say, you know, I know that they work in conjunction with each other, but uh, a, a lot of times people hear about, you know, sending your shocks off to have this or that done. Um, it's a little bit more expensive to go have your shocks revalved and, and readjusted internally um, than it is, you know, hey, let's just upgrade the springs and let's just see what happens there. Um, is it... You know, in your opinion, if you had a choice to respring something and just leave it there, or if you had a choice to revalve it and do the entire situation, I mean, how much, obviously, revalving and rebuilding the shock is going to be better, but how much of a difference does it actually make, you know, versus just a spring package? Uh, spring rates make a huge deal. Um, they're a big difference getting your spring rate right for your vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, it all depends on what valving and shock ratios. There's a whole lot that actually goes into it, and I've actually had the luxury of hanging out with Bill while he tuned shocks. And yeah. Kind of picked up some of the stuff that he's taught that he knows, and it really works hand in hand because you want to get your spring rate right, and then once you get your spring rate right, you can start working on the valving of the shocks and actually how the shocks actually perform. Yeah. And having somebody that knows what they're doing mm -hmm. is worth their weight in gold. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a couple of guys I, uh, I follow on Instagram, and they'll, they'll occasionally post pictures of a of a whiteboard calendar, and they're like, "Hey guys, I have this much time. Good luck fighting for a spot." So. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, the shock training is really catching on out east now. Over the past couple of years, you see guys like Kenny Cameron. Yeah. I mean, he spends hundreds of hours getting his suspension dialed in and that's why he's so successful at what he does i i think the word is dominant honestly because it, it seems i know uh they actually finished the season opener yesterday and uh he took first place and, and i haven't gotten a chance to watch the footage but um you know he typically he typically wins in style i'll say that yeah i kind of got stuck watching the srs live yesterday i kind of yep. ruined my pro productivity <laughs> on a saturday yeah 
it's amazing how much uh, guys are starting to catch on this year. I was really impressed with the amount of guys that spent the time in the offseason changing the rigs, spending the time getting them tuned in, shocks yeah. tuning. I think he's going to have some challenges this year from some other people, but uh, he's still the best, hands down, no yeah. question. Yeah, so those other people, you know, uh, just to, you want do you want to say names? Anybody you think's uh, in the in the hunt there? I was really impressed with John Campbell. Uh, Ryan Boyd came out. I was really impressed with the way he drove uh, that buggy that TC built that he owns. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Will Stewart's always consistent. I mean, he's going to do his thing. So is Brandon Davis. Right. And you can't, the Bacons, I mean, Bubba Bacon, he's just he's one of the best, hands down. Absolutely. Uh, he spends the time. He's got his stuff working right. Uh, his little brother, Tim, had a great run. I think there's... There's a bunch of people this year. I was really, really impressed with the uh, talent that stepped up this year to really come out and go for it. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, now we've talked about suspension and some of the other drivers. Um, your bouncer rig, uh, you said you got it from a guy who raced King of Hammers in the year previously. Uh, who designed the chassis? Because I know uh, that... He, he actually designed the chassis himself. Uh, he, Mike Colville, he built the whole car. Yeah. We're actually one of my other buddies, Craig Busich. And then Craig raced the car for a couple years, and Mike moved to China and wanted a car to race huh. at the Hammers, and yeah. called Craig and made a deal, got the car, raced it, and then I ended up with it. Wow, that's awesome. That's, it's good to know that you got something that works. That's the, that's the best part. Um, so going back to your bouncer days just one more time, uh, I distinctly remember seeing something crazy uh, watching you tumble down a hill at Winrock, and that was Race to Riches, correct? Yeah, that was a race to riches. That was probably the most, if not the most, one of the most violent rolls I've seen in a long time. I know um, Mad Ram has a couple of videos of it. You know, you don't have to search too hard to find it. But, you know, just so people understand, I've been to Winrock and I've seen those hills. And at the top of those hills, it almost, you know, caves back out towards, you know, the way you're coming back up. Uh, talk about, you know, I don't know how much you remember or, or think about it, but those hills at Winrock, they're no joke. Um, what's it like to sit at the bottom of that and just think to yourself, you know, all right, well, I'm, you know, we're taking it to the top. I mean, that's one of those hills you really never forget. Um, I got unlucky that day and got and drew 50th, so I was the dead wow. last person to hit that hill that day. Yeah. So I had to sit there and watch all my fellow competitors, which a lot of people had the same outcome I did and ended right. up rolling back down it. Mm -hmm. uh, the hill got worse throughout the day, too, which in, when you're staring at the bottom of it and you see somebody get up there and get stuck and start digging out holes, it's, yeah. just, it's not a fun day. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's nothing like climbing those big hills. But you got to put it out of your mind. Once you leave the line, you, you're there to do your job. You're there to win. You're there to climb the hill. you got to completely block that out and just go for it. So that's one thing I've noticed about you uh, as the time I've been watching you, starting from the bouncers to the side-by-sides, is you don't have the mentality of, we're going to go out here and finish. You have the mentality of, we're going to go out here, we're going to get first place, and we're going to get first place by a mile. Um, can you tell me, like... What does that edge do for you when you talk to competitors? And what does that edge do for you just in general when you're getting your car ready, when you're out on the racetrack? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I've grew up, I've always been a fan of Shannon Campbell. I've watched him from back in the rock crawling days. And I can always remember him saying he always wants to be out front. He right. wants clean air. He wants to push. He wants to be the person setting the pace. And after all the success he's had, I've tried to take that in and I really like being out front and having clean air and running my own race. Mm -hmm. And once once you get it, I like to be able to charge and push and not worry about making mistakes and running in with traffic and yeah. having somebody else change your race. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, whenever you have that mentality, um, I know personally I have that mentality in, uh, you know, I go to the gym, things like that, and I'm very mindset, like the very goal-driven and very much uh, dialed in. When you're out there talking to other competitors, especially in, you know, you've gotten a chance to see the SRRS and also Ultra 4, uh, you know, are, are guys friendly out there? Is it cutthroat? At what level does it become, you know, a job and people stop, stop being friendly? I mean, we're all a big family in reality. Um, that's one thing I love about the off-road racing community. It doesn't matter if you're talking to rock bouncing or ultra four racing 
everybody, it's cutthroat. Uh, don't get me wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody out there wants to beat everybody, but they'll also do everything they can to make sure you're out there at your best <laughs> and you've got the equipment underneath yeah. you to run them at your best. Yeah. And that's the big thing I love is that everybody helps everybody because we all want to be out there and we all want to be the best. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's something that I personally have found too. Uh, you know, even just trail riding, if, if somebody's broke down, you know, you'll always hear everybody that passes by, hey, you doing okay? You need something? Well, you know, y'all are, are going to make it back okay? And uh, that's something that drew me to the off-road world too, and uh, especially seeing that a lot of the bouncer guys, you know, they're at the bottom of the hill just talking and laughing, and, uh, you know, I, I always hear one guy say, you know, well, so-and-so is not going to make it up, and everybody gets a good laugh, and, it, you know, it, it seems like good camaraderie. Oh, it's great. You know, I mean, some of my best friends now that I talk to daily are people I've met through racing and people that I compete with on a daily basis. And it's it's fun being able to cut up with your friends, you know what I mean? And yeah, absolutely. Everybody's there to have a good time, but everybody's there to win, too, at the same time. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, so let's go ahead and get into your side-by-side. -side. What made you go from, you know, it seems like the last time I saw you race in the bouncer was that right, uh, race to Riches Hill and you kind of took a tumble down, um, did that, did that just, did, did, like, did that deter you from wanting to run bouncer class, or what pushed you to primarily run side-by-sides? Um, I'd already planned on selling the car at the end of that season, okay. um, and the uh, bouncer, uh, the big roll at Rush just kind of made me tear the car completely down and rebuild it for the guy that ended up getting it. Sure. Um, I like the side-by-side -side stuff, the market's huge, um, the progression in the machines the past couple of years is absolutely insane. Yeah. Uh, it's insane of what, going from the 800s when they first came out to what the Turbo 1000s will do now. It's, yeah. it's <laughs> there's no worse. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Especially, I mean, the, the Turbo S that's come out is just leaps and bounds just better than the Turbo. And uh, I remember having the discussion with someone that, when they got into a 900 XP, they're like, I've never felt something so small like this have that much power and be so maneuverable. And, you know, now you get in a Turbo S and it feels like you're in an airplane. Yeah, the suspension has just progressed so much. And now running the Turbo S has come with 32 inch tire stock. Crazy. I remember when we were wheeling and if you had 32 inch tires, you actually had something. Yeah, absolutely. Trust me, absolutely. Uh, so, coming from the bouncers, uh, what platform did you race side by sides first? Uh, actually, the same Polaris that I race right now okay. is the first one that I ever raced. Uh, it's a 2017 Turbo. Okay, the 2017 Turbo. So, obviously, you run the Mad Ram UTV. It's plastered all over the side of it. Um, how did you guys meet? And uh, you know, talk, talk a little bit about that. How did how did you become the face of Mad Ram on the race course? Um, I've been a fan of Cole's work uh, forever. I can remember when his videos first started coming out and just following everything that he was doing. And I, he used to come up to Dirty Turtle to all the events that were going on up there, and mm -hmm. uh, we started talking at one event, then started talking at all the events that we were at, and. Uh, he asked me to do some filming for him, so I started doing filming for him, and we became buddies. Yeah. And uh, one thing progressed to another, and we were up here at a um, AOP race, and he had just got the new turbo from Polaris, and asked me if I wanted to drive it. And I hopped in the driver's seat and haven't got out. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, man. That, that's great. Um, so something else before we go uh, back to the Ultra Four side, I want to I want to actually re rewind a little bit. Um, where in your competition history, have you had your best finish? Uh, my best finish, I've won two 4,500 class races when we raced the Cherokee right. in Ultra 4. And last year, um, I went out to Reno for the Ultra 4 Nationals and won the side-by-side -side class. Now, I was super excited to see that you won that side-by-side -side class last year because I know that you guys had had a little bit of issues with belts, um, it seemed like, I'm not sure you guys were blowing axles, I, it seemed like you guys were just in like a rough spot, like uh, the, the equipment wouldn't just hold up for you guys, and to see you come out and win the Nationals, that was like, you know, just being a fan, it was like, man, that makes me feel so good for those guys. How did it feel to, to have that machine issues and then come out and just, just have some great success at an awesome event to win, you know? Um, it was definitely needed at the time. It had been a rough year. Uh, 
we lost a motor at a race yep. um, in the Pro Rock Series, and then at the last race of the East Coast Ultra Four Series, we ripped the front diff out of the frame a quarter Ooh. mile into the race. Ooh, um, we were sitting third in East Coast points at that point, and that pretty much just took us and threw us out of the championship hunt right. completely. Um, and that, that win meant everything. It kind of remotivated me for this year and getting the car ready and making the charge to actually win the whole national championship this year. So would you say, you know, when you say you blew the motor, um, you know, what would you say would be your worst break? I mean, ripping a front diff out of a car, is, is that's pretty rough. But did you ever have one where it was just like you destroyed the entire machine? Um, my rollover at Winrock in the big car, um, it destroyed some stuff it <laughs> ruined my motor ripped all eight motor Ooh. mount bolts out of the block um, cracked the transmission housing bunch of damage to the frame yeah that was probably the worst one i mean the car took it great i walked away yeah. uninjured i mean you can't ask for anything better than that yeah absolutely but i'd say that's the worst damage in the big car and of course the blow in the motor and the razor that was probably the biggest one so far when the rod's hanging out the block it's pretty much a total yeah i was at that point. <laughs> you know i thought it was going to be like silly i was gonna be like well you know if you blow a motor is it all internal or did you know you have something actually blow out the side and if you have something blow out the side it's pretty rough yeah it's pretty much done at that point it becomes <laughs> a uh, paperweight yeah absolutely um so you've you've raced all over the country um where has been your least favorite place to go race like if you're looking at the schedule and you see this place on there you know what where's that place for you oklahoma hands down oklahoma why oklahoma that's that's so random um it's a far drive from kentucky yeah it's in certainly. the middle of nowhere um let's see the first year we went there was two years ago uh when i was still racing 4400 class and i don't know if you remember this race but it was the muddiest race i've ever ran in my entire life they rescued cars the complete day after with bulldozers that were sank to where you could barely see the roof. Now, was this, uh, like, I don't want to say a flat track by any means, but it, it was a little less wooded, uh, and there was just cars out there stuck on the main course? Oh, there was cars stuck everywhere. Oh. <laughs> uh, it was like a quicksand mud. I've never, I've never seen anything like this in any courses I've ever been on. Yeah. We were, uh, there was times we'd be third gear low range on the rev limiter and we'd barely be moving. Oh my God. It was everything you could do just to keep forward momentum in the car. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds awful. Now, my question obviously is, have you ever gone back and raced after that race? Yeah, we went back last year and ran in the side by side <laughs> and it actually didn't rain and, uh, I still don't, it's still not my favorite place to go, but it was, it really was decently enjoyable last year. Yeah, absolutely. So that leads me to my next question. Where's your favorite place to race? I'd have to say Dirty Turtle Off-Road Park. Really? Um, that or King of the Hammers. Yeah. Um, King of the Hammers, of course, is King of the Hammers, but uh, Dirty Turtle is my home track. I've raced there, wheeled there for 15 years. I know the place. It's just, I love it. I feel when I go there, I've got an advantage over everybody else. Yeah, certainly. So what makes Dirty Turtle, you know, what kind of terrain is it for those who haven't been there? Because I personally actually have never been up to the Kentucky side. Um, what makes that park, you know, so good? Because they hold races there. It seems like multiple races every year. I know yeah, they, they, they do they a... Hold them. Go ahead. Rock bouncing stuff, um, Ultra 4 stuff, Pro Rock Racing. Um, our season opener actually is next weekend there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for the survival series they've got a good mixture it's not a huge park by any means um it's only a couple hundred acres but they've got plenty of trails plenty of obstacles it's a good mixture um they've got a fantastic short course okay which uh, gets tied into the endurance racing side of things yeah and i, I want to talk a little bit more about that later um but you know if you had to if you had to pick the perfect race for you it sounds like it would be uh exactly what's coming up next weekend going to be that survival race at dirty turtle does that sound right yeah that's uh i really love short course racing uh, and if you throw that in with survival that really helps out i feel uh sort of my driving style yeah so i actually uh, I, I learned a little bit more about the survival um that's coming up for the pro rock series this is brand new for this year um if i'm not mistaken they said it's going to be roughly a two-hour race 
Uh, we'll be running right at about an hour um, okay. at Dirty Turtle. Okay. Uh, they've got a pro am class. They'll be running before us, which will be running at an hour too for people that want to come out and just give it a try. Sure. Um, it'll be the sec. This is actually the second year for the series. Uh, last year was the first year for it. Then okay. this year, Polaris has actually come on board to wow. be the primary sponsor for the series. Yeah, that's great, man. It's good to hear that you know the manufacturers are getting behind this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's great seeing growth and uh, seeing the car count start to increase again. Uh, it was really disappointing a few years ago. I mean, the sport took a big hit, and a lot of people kind of went away. And mm -hmm. now we're starting to see a lot more people come back and start racing again. Was there any particular reason this, you think the sport took a hit? Did anything happen? There really wasn't much racing on the East Coast. Uh, a lot of the series went away. There was only a few races a year. Uh, people got busy. Of course, the economy took a hit. And, right. Uh, Racing got put to the wayside there for a while. Certainly. But with everything improving, uh, you're seeing a lot more series pop up, a lot more racing. I mean, it's there's a full schedule this year of racing. If you want to race every weekend, there's always something to do. Yeah, there is. And, and that was something I noticed this year as well is uh, we have a lot of guys who race crossover in all the different leagues. And, um, you know, just like you said, you can stay busy every single weekend and uh, I don't understand how these guys travel that much. You know, they uh, they do quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of mileage on their vehicles just to get to race every single weekend. Yeah, it's a major commitment to make it all happen. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to do what I do and get the prep done on the car and everything, and be able to travel and make it to the races that we make. And we did, we'll do probably 15 or 16 events this year. That's awesome. That's awesome. So when you get in the car ready, you know, anyone that follows you on Instagram. Uh, they see you are very thorough with your prep. I mean, you I've seen this thing torn down on a table to about nothing, you know, a few days before a race. And, you know, you guys are bolt checking everything, fluid, everything that you guys have ever had issues with. You know, I see that you're taking care of it. What is What goes into, you know, for, the, for this weekend, you know, what are you going to do to prepare your, your car? Um, we actually just got back from the hammers, uh, about three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I've got the car tore down right now in my shop. Um, all the bearings, hubs, suspension parts will come off of it, go through all, uh, red lock tight, all the bolts, check everything, go through it, uh, pretty much front to back every, we try to check every single component of the car and check for cracks and make sure everything's going to be operational before the next race. So that kind of thoroughness and tearing down everything like that, you know, has, has, has that, have you ever found a big crack or, you know, what do you think the value is? Cause I have a lot of people, um, that race and, you know, between you and I, they, uh, they'll, they'll wash their rig off and then load it up on the trailer and just hope that it's good for the next race. Yeah. Uh, my buddy Casey got me on the whole prep thing. Uh, he pushed me real hard to make sure everything was on point when we showed up and it's taken me a while to get on his level of how he liked everything to be, but mm -hmm. Once you get there and you make and you show up knowing that your machine is at a hundred percent, it really helps with your confidence as a driver. Knowing yeah. you've touched every bolt, you have touched <laughs> every component. When you push into that corner, you know everything's right. Yeah, I mean, you know, just uh, to to shine a little bad light on myself, there's sometimes I make a repair on my own razor and go trail riding, and I pull it off the trailer and I'm like, man, I really hope that works. <laughs> oh, you're not the only one. We do that as racers too. Sometimes, sometimes you got to do what you got to do to get to the race. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so you have a 2017 Turbo. Um, what wheels and tires you're running on there? Uh, we're running the BFG 32-inch KR2s, and we're running the Fuel Trophy wheels. So those those uh, KR is KR2, correct? Yes, sir. To make sure I heard it correct. Um, the KR2, I've had a lot of questions about those as far as East Coast riding. Obviously, in the West, it seems that that's the tire of choice, just because it's a uh, does seem to does well, seem to do well in the sand, the dirt, and uh, has a really good pattern for the rocks. Uh, East Coast, how does that work for you? I've actually been really impressed with it. Um, I never expected it to do as well as it does this year. It does. Um, it's it actually cleans out really well. Uh, for as tight as a tire it is, it actually opens up. I, you know, as far as East Coast racing, I mean, pretty much if we're racing on the East Coast, it's going to rain. Yeah, one hundred percent. So last year we got to spend a lot of time driving through the mud with these tires and the side bite. I mean, everything about the tire. I, I can't talk about how much I love the tire. I mean, it's it's almost indestructible. You've got to make a big mistake to pop one of them. 
That's good to hear. That's really good to hear. So uh, on the idea of tire and wheel, I know that when you guys were running the short course last year, um, you guys threw 29s on there and hoped to gain a little bit more speed and save the belt. Was that the goal? Yeah, the goal was to gain a little more corner speed, being able to back it in a little harder. Um, I've actually got a set of 30-inch KR2s we'll be running for qualifying and short course racing this year. Very nice. Uh, we'll take the big 32s off and put the 30s on for qualifying to try to pick up uh, – 10th here, 10th there, every little bit counts with yeah. the competition this year. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, do you really notice a big difference going from 30 to 32? Uh, tremendous. The corner roll of the tire, um, as hard as you can back it in, I, you can tell a huge difference between switching between the two tires as far as handling characteristics of the car. Now, now that's the same size wheel on there, correct? Same size wheel, 15-inch. Okay. That's correct. cool. That's really cool. And that's uh, it's kind of cool to be able to have the opportunity to test those sizes and have you know such a strong opinion on it because a lot of guys out there, when they're deciding tire sizes or wheel sizes, they're like, you know, they kind of get one shot. And to hear that, you know, with a 32, obviously you're going to get a little bit more clearance, but, you know, in those hard corners, you're gonna, you are going to have that little bit of roll with the tire. And uh, guys who like to race faster, you know, I always tell people who, who want to go out and they want to just run their, their razor through the woods at, you know, 40 miles an hour, uh, you know, maybe a, maybe a smaller tire is a little bit better for you, a little bit tighter uh, feel to it. And, you know, everybody wants to run the big tire. So <laughs> you always it's see guys. On parts. That's the bit, that's the downside of the big tires is you got to have the parts to be able to stand up to taking the beating that the big tires put down all, all the suspension and axles and everything else. I can tell a huge difference on load and wear running the small 30s as far as putting pressure on the wheel bearings and such than running the 32. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a lesson that everyone will learn at some point and you'll probably learn it the hard way. <laughs> yeah, uh, wheel bearings on these things are the downfall so far, which um, I got a new sponsor this year. Zollinger Racing came out with their billet carriers for the rear and that seemed to solve the issues we were having with blowing the bearings out of the stock casings with the big tires so that we carrier? were just seeing so much side load uh -huh. um, from the tire applying load to the bearing it was actually blowing the casing out on the stock hubs yeah I, the bearing itself wasn't failing it was actually the casing so i actually had a very similar issue uh i had a razor buggy um that i had built and uh, i got from a guy and we ran it pretty hard for a while and uh, that's one thing I, I mean, I was changing bearings probably every other ride, uh, and, and I, you know, never really seemed to find the remedy for it before I, uh, before I got rid of it, but it's good to hear that, you know, if you're having bearing issues, or if you're really rough on the car, especially that side, that side load on there, um, that, uh, that an upgraded carrier w will make the difference. Yeah, we ran them at KOH, um, this year is the first time we've ran them, uh, we just got them on the car, and they they're still perfect. Um, I just got done checking them yesterday, actually. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is just some of the other upgrades you guys have. Um, I know that you guys do have sponsors that help you with uh, suspension parts, things like that. Um, tell me, you guys, uh, who do you guys use for your arms and your, your uh, suspension components around the rear? Uh, we use ATV 4Play for all of our suspension stuff on the car. Um, it's been on there since day one. Uh, this is actually the second set of suspension stuff we've had from them on the car. Mm -hmm. uh, we made some changes on the ARM geometry a little bit to try to gain some performance advantage this year. Sure. When you say, you know, if you can talk about it, I know sometimes they like to keep that under the covers. Uh, when you say geometry changes, you know, what, 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 makes a, what makes a set of arms work better? Um, we've played with them a little bit. Uh, I can't kind of really divulge everything we've done yeah. with them yet until we get, um, finished testing them. Sure. But, um, we've added a little bit of camber. I won't say how much, sure. but it seems to really be helping with the uh, handling of the car. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll, and, you know, we'll leave that there. Uh, as far as ball joints, um, I've seen Keller ball joints in person and they, they seem like they're the size of my fist. Uh, did they really make a big difference? In, as far they as like... make a huge difference. I actually ran their standard ball joints all last season, and we made the switch this year to the new mega joints, and I had zero failures out of their standard ball joints, so I'm sure the mega joints, I don't even worry about them. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's one part for me, too. I know 
uh, I had a turbo back a while and jumped it a few times and uh, ended up with uh, four broken ball joints <laughs> just about every time. Yeah. yeah, Kellers are kind of one of those things you put them in and you just kind of forget about them. That's you make good. sure you grease them and they're good to go. That's, that's great. Um, so are you guys running any other parts, axles, uh, anything else that, that's worth mentioning to our listeners? Yeah, we did uh, Joe Kaufman, Kaufman Machine, came out with the RS1 diff swap last year. Um, After we ripped the diff out of the frame, we ended up going to his kit. Um, I can't say enough about the factory RS1 diff. Uh, I haven't heard it make a noise yet. Yeah, it seems they got it right. Now, you guys don't have that welded or anything like that. It's just straight from the factory. We were running a straight factory, bolted in RS1 diff. Uh, That's crazy. We beat it countless times, never made a noise. Uh, we went to RCB Pro Series axles this year. Haven't heard a peep out of those. I mean, they've been great. We run their prop shaft also, which it's been excellent. I can't say enough about it. Uh, do you guys have anything transmission, uh, anything else like that? Any other upgrades? Uh, we made some upgrades to the transmission. We've changed the gearing around a little bit and kind of get it suited to where I want to be. Uh, Adam Harvey, uh, Air Dam, he does all of our clutching. Uh, we went down and worked with him last year in Mississippi and got the clutch dialed in. Uh, I'd say that's probably been one of the biggest improvements we've made on the Razor overall is getting the clutching dialed in, and that's probably been my biggest downfall is figuring out how to do clutching coming from the big cars with transmissions to a Razor with a clutch. It's right. been a rough learning curve. Yeah, absolutely, and there's something to be said for going to someone who knows what they're doing. Yeah, you can't – the clutching stuff, it's uh, – you got to know what you're doing to get it dialed in, and it's worth paying somebody that knows what they're doing to have your stuff work right, especially with endurance racing when you're relying on a belt to last an hour or two hours or yeah. a KOH eight. Yeah. Uh, it's really hard. So that leads me to my next question. Uh, you know, I have, a, I have a few that kind of fall in this category. For performance in mind, what's the best all-around enhancement you've made to the, to the factory razor? Um. As far as handling characteristics, I would say the best improvement we made is the Walker Evan shocks. Okay. Um, we've ran them for two years. They're great. Um, the stuff it'll take, the hard hits, it's it's insane. Okay. Now, would I'll you say, would you recommend those shocks to someone who just goes trail riding? Doesn't you know maybe um, a little bit of fast stuff, but or, or is there an in between step? Uh, there's an in between step. Um, there's a couple companies out there that do spring kits, and like I said, you can get with one of the shock trainers and have them valve your factory shocks, um, and that makes a really big improvement on the ride quality and how well your vehicle is going to work. And it's shock tuning something that you want to set up for your individual taste, yeah. the way you want your vehicle to ride. And the Walker Evans shocks out of the box for performance-wise, if you want to go fast and just bolt on something, you can't beat them. I mean, yeah. the performance is outstanding. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so what would you say, you know, now we've talked about performance, we've talked about suspension, um, comfort, comfort. You're, you're obviously, you're in that car for eight hours. You need something uh, that's going to feel good. seats. I've ran the same suspension seats um, since the beginning. I've always had PRP seats in my car. Um, I love them. Safety, I feel comfortable. I feel secure. I run their belts, all their stuff. Uh, it's been excellent. Okay. I mean, you Awesome. Like we talked about earlier, some of the big crashes I've been able to yeah. get out of, walk away with the Hans device and everything that we're required to run, um, yeah. it's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Safety is something that, you know, if you're trail riding and you don't wear your seatbelt, you know, you're you're one rollover away from losing your arm or your life. And uh, Yeah, seatbelts are a major, uh, major thing. I don't get in anything without putting my seatbelt on first. Even if we're just going to the line, I'll put my lap belt on and make sure I'm strapped in, at least give me uh, some security. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one thing I've always noticed, too, is when I'm secured down in my rig, uh, I drive better because I personally am more stable in my seat, so I have better handling on the on the steering wheel, the gas, the brakes, everything. Uh, it doesn't make a sense to me why anyone would ever not wear their seatbelt. No, the, the tired you are in your rig, the better you're going to drive. If you're not getting ragdolled around, you're going to be in a lot more control and feel a lot more controlled. Yeah, absolutely. So my next question is, uh, what's the one thing that you guys have had to deal with on the rig that just was, uh, you know, for lack of better words, just a pain in the ass. Uh, and how did you guys get it fixed? Clutching. Clutching. <laughs> clutching, uh, we found out last year at King of the Hammers, clutching on a razor is very important. Um, we fought belt temp heat um, over and over, breaking belts, blowing belts, could not get it figured out. And finally we got a hold of Adam with Air Dam, and 
he got us situated and so far we've been really lucky with our setup good 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 so uh before we talk about your your uh your season last season i i'm actually on your instagram and uh it looks like at one point you had ultra bouncer as a rental yeah uh one of my buddies actually owned ultra bouncer and uh, my car was tore apart it was uh missing a motor at the time so we had a qualifier for a big race, and he was kind enough to let me borrow Ultra Bouncer. Ultra Bouncer is one of those mythological uh, vehicles that, uh, you know, it's it, it's not around anymore. Is that correct? Um, it's actually been reincarnated. Um, parts of it were sold. The chassis actually got cut apart and uh, rebuilt. And it's uh, it's no longer in its original form. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, well, cool. Let's talk about your season last season. Uh, you know, obviously we've touched on your win at the it was ultra four nationals and uh where did you guys place you know where did you guys race you know you don't have to give me the long story but just touch on how you guys did last season uh we started off actually pretty good um we ended up coming up second at the first initial pro rock survival race down at busted knuckle off road park right behind jay shaw Mm -hmm. um and then after that we kind of started running into issues with our clutching with blowing motors dips uh we ended up running the whole east coast ultra four series which took us to pennsylvania oklahoma and then dirty turtle uh, i think we ended up seventh or eighth for the east coast series uh then we ended up going to reno and doing nationals with ultra four that ended up uh putting us fifth overall for national points yeah uh with that win that helped a lot um and then we also did some local races at Dirty Turtle. They've got a cool series they run and some local stuff we did to just kind of fill in the time. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so last year you guys ran King of the Hammers, correct? Yeah, we ended up uh, timing out last year about 15 miles from the finish. So was that your first year running King of the Hammers? That was my first year in a side-by-side. We had raced the previous year in the 4400 class, and that, I think, was our fourth year consecutively going. Okay. Now – you know, full size, 4,400, 4,500 uh, to the side by side. What's the biggest thing you noticed? Difference? The biggest thing with the side by side is you've got to watch what you hit. Um, the big cars with 40 inch tires, they'll eat basketball size rocks, <laughs> five gallon. I mean, they'll, you can hit them 50, 60 miles an hour and don't even notice that you hit them. That's awesome. Um, with the racers, you've got to be a lot more careful. You've got to be a lot more picky with your line choice and how you use the car. Uh, the 4,400 cars, I mean, they're tanks. They're yeah. they're built so well that you can beat on them, and the Razors just can't, they cannot take the abuse that the big cars can. You've got to be very careful at how you use your equipment up throughout the day. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, was there one moment when you guys were racing last year uh, that really st- like stuck out to you? Um, the first year, the, I guess the funnest thing was coming down back door. Yeah, um, yeah, that's so that's the that picture. That was an interesting experience in yeah, a razor. Yeah, that's the picture I actually have on the Racing on the Rocks Instagram page. If you're not following us, go ahead and check that out. Um, and you got this awesome picture of the Mad Ram logo. And, you know, your front wheels are 100% touching the ground. And your back wheels look like they are just barely holding on to that waterfall. Yeah, it was a pretty sketchy moment. Um, it was pretty cool. It kind of turned out really good. We kind of dropped off of it and sat right down. Away we went. Um, a lot of people weren't as fortunate as we were with their backdoor experience. Um, but it really impressed me. I'd say the biggest thing I came away with the first year we raced the side-by-side was how impressive the razors are in the rocks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, did you find yourself bottoming out a lot? Yeah, you you got to be really careful with your line choice in the razor. Uh the, the belly becomes an issue and keeping the razor from getting high centered. Uh, we actually found ourselves high centered once this year when I backed up and got us hung up on a rock. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, the razors, uh, they're really impressive at what the, the rock crawling capabilities are. If you pick your line choice and you're, that's the difference between the razor and the 4,400 cars. You can be a lot more maneuverable in the side by side. You're able to pick your lines and get places where the big cars can't. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Um, so fast forward to this year, you guys finished the season last year. Um, King of Hammers just wrapped up about three weeks ago. Uh, how did you guys come into King of Hammers this year? Um, was the mindset different? Did y'all have the car prepared differently? Uh, how did that go for you guys? Uh, we came in with the mindset this year. We knew we wanted to go finish. Uh, we didn't really care where we finished. We knew we wanted to give it a good shot at a top 10. Mm-hmm. Um, 
we started getting the car ready. Um, actually, back in Thanksgiving, we started working on the car and get, getting everything ready for the hammers. And like everything in racing, it comes down to the last minute. We ended up having some issues with a wiring harness and some other things that really put us behind the eight ball for the race this year. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, who was your co-driver? Uh, Cole Shirley actually co-drives with me at King of the Hammers. And Cole Shirley is Mad Ram, correct? The, yeah, Cole the, Shirley the is Mad Ram 11. All right, excellent. And just for our listeners who don't know, that's his actual name. <laughs> um, so you guys get to King of the Hammers. Uh, you know, when you guys get there, normally people do, you know, shock tuning. They kind of work out the last-minute bugs in your car. Do you guys have to do any of that? That was our plan. Um, when we left, that was our plan was to meet up with Walker Evans, get the new shocks on the car, get everything tuned in, do pre-running. Um, with our wiring harness issues, we actually did not get a running car going until 15 minutes before we had to be at the line for power hour. Woo! That's that. Uh, that's a bad time right there. Yeah, it was a long week. We put 16-hour days in every day. We were there trying to get the car sorted out. Um, we had a lot of help from other teams trying to go through and work the bugs out. Dino Jet. Um, they came on board this year. They spent a lot of time with us trying to diagnose the car with different tunes and different stuff to try to get it to act right. Yeah. We thought we had it fixed. It ran great for qualifying. We were able to come away with the 28th qualifying spot, um, yeah. which we were really happy with considering we didn't do any pre-running on the qualifying course or anything. Right, right. That's excellent. That's excellent. Um, so going into race day, uh, the you know you guys are in the car for eight hours, correct? Yeah, we uh, we finished the race this year, I think, a little over seven hours, seven hours and 20 minutes, roughly. So the first lap is mostly desert, correct? Yeah, the first lap is uh, roughly 90-mile desert loop. So when you're when you're just, like, crushing it through the desert like that, you know, how does it, how does the car handle, I mean, you as a driver, is it really just, like, looking straight ahead and just, you know, the suspension doing its magic and... Or, or is it this rough experience? You know, tell me a little bit about that, because a lot of the guys who listen to this are East Coast based, and uh, we don't have opportunity like that just to get out there and just crush it and bomb through the desert. And I would say driving in the desert is probably my biggest weakness that I've had to work on. Um, it's just something totally different from what we experience out here, like you said, on the East Coast. Um, I got the luxury of talking with Tom Ways a while, and he gave me some good advice on how to go fast in the desert. Yeah, and. Um, Pretty much, you got to look ahead of where you're going. If you're focused on where you're at, you're going to run into issues. You've got to be looking way ahead because things happen so fast when you're running 60, 70 miles an hour out in the desert. Yeah. And you've got to be looking out for the big three foot holes, the big stuff, the Ooh. big square edge bumps that are going to hurt your equipment. <laughs> I said that'll wake you up real quick. Yeah, there was a couple spots this year. You'd be cruising along pretty good, nice smooth trail. Then all of a sudden, um, you'd be in some pretty harsh stuff. Yeah, yeah. So uh, once you guys got through the desert, uh, first lap, did everything go okay? Uh, we kind of had some issues on the first lap. Uh, broke the sway bar about 10 miles out. That was after we started. Uh, next to We left the line next to Casey Shear, one of my good buddies, and we were both laughing. We were excited about it, thinking we were going to battle each other out on lap one. Yeah. And we made it about 50 feet, and the car went into lit mode. Oh, man. Just completely lost all power, shut it off, tried to reset it, shut it off, tried to reset it, uh, which was the same issues we were fighting before that we thought we had finally figured out. Yeah. So we just decided to run it in lit mode and see how far we made it. So. And uh, <laughs> we, made it, we made it into pit one, um, realized we didn't have four-wheel drive. Uh, we had a connector come loose in the dash, so we had to pull the dash off, get that fixed, and uh, took got a little bit of fuel because uh, we weren't quite able to make it from pit B back to pit uh, pit one again without taking fuel. Yeah, that was a little over sixty miles, and we didn't want to push our luck. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, how'd the race go from there? Oh, uh, the race went pretty good. Uh, we came back into pit one. Uh, they went to give us fuel, and we realized our radius rods had cracked. Nice. Uh, so they made the call to Maine. We made it into Maine uh, without any issues. And the guys from Miller Motorsports, Casey Gilbert, uh, Gilbert Brothers Motorsports, he's one of my really good buddies. They hopped right in it, got the welder out, got the radius rods welded up, kind of went over the car and sent us on our way again. Nice. Um, from, from there on, we really didn't run into much issues. Uh, we went through the rocks relatively easy. Everything went great. Um made it through outer limits clean winch one time um out of spooners and we lost a belt about 15 miles from the finish line Oof. 
Yeah. So we got are, out, yeah. got it changed, lost probably 30 minutes, cut the belt out and everything yeah. that went along with that. Um, got back in the car and cruised to the finish line to a 20th position. 20th position. So you guys, do you know how many racers there were at the beginning? Who uh, there were 113 this year. So you had 113 and you guys finished 20th. How does that feel to where as last year you guys timed out? Uh, it feels great. Um, I couldn't, ex uh, there's nothing like finishing the hammers. I mean, so little people are able to actually cross the finish line in the time that the race is allowed that it's, there's nothing like finishing that race. Um, it meant everything just to make it to the finish line. When you guys make it to the finish line, you know, uh, I'm assuming you guys didn't immediately know where you'd placed, but you know, when you pull up, they they have you pull up onto this little deck area with a with a screen behind you, and uh, I think on your Instagram there's a picture of you being interviewed. Uh, you know, what do they ask you whenever you're just sitting there, just pulled up? What you, what's going through your head? What are you talking about? Um, they pretty much want to know how your race went, what you thought of the course, uh, sponsors, of course, everybody that helps you get there. Without, I mean, all the help, it's, none of this is even possible. Mm -hmm. um, kind of your overall race, what you thought. Um, I thought the course was great this year. I thought Dave did a great job. He gave us a couple options on some either ors, which kind of played a really cool role in the race this year. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So when you uh, when you pulled up and you got done and you, you guys got out of the car, what's the first thing you did? Uh, get something to drink. Get something uh, to drink. <laughs> <laughs> get something to drink, relax a little bit. It's pretty cool the way they do it at the King of the Hammers. Uh, everybody that kind of finishes kind of parks their car in the center of the Hammer Town. So you get to kind of hop out and see all your buddies. Um, we were fortunate this year. A couple of guys from the East Coast, we all kind of finished in real close to each other. So we were all hanging out together and got yeah. to share war stories from the day. Yeah, that's great. So was there any particular moment that their story that you guys remember? I mean, what was, what was the that moment for you where you were like, ah, this is going to be stuck in my head about this race? Um, when we were sitting in Outer Limits, uh, we were hanging out there and Anthony Yoke was right beside me with some issues, uh, yeah. beating on his car and... Dan Fresh was in front of us. He was doing some winching and beating his car. Zollinger was there. There's a lot of guys just sitting in Outer Limits, and it's like, wow. It's like, we're in here. This trail is nuts. It's like, there is no reason a razor should ever be in these trails, and yeah. here we are sitting here beating our equipment to death. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Uh, you know, was there, did you guys have any other moments like that? Uh, everything else went kind of easy. Uh, we kind of had a little whoops moment. Uh, I got a bad kick about halfway through lap one, and we came up on two wheels at about 45 miles an hour, <laughs> driving sideways through the brush, and uh, Cole kind of yelled at me a little bit, told me to calm down and keep everything together, and we kind of settled down and just ran a smooth, we kind of ran a smooth, easy pace all day. We were limited to about 50 miles an hour, which I think, now looking back on it, probably kept us out of getting in trouble and kept the car together. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's good. So, you know, you guys get through King of the Hammers, you place 20th, which is a huge improvement over last year. It seems like you guys are, you know, being set up to have your best race year ever. Yeah, I'm really hoping this year that with everything we went through last year, being our first year racing side by sides and kind of figuring out clutching and all the downsides of the parts and what you need to keep one of these things together. Um, I think we got a really good program in place this year, and I'm really hoping we're able to bring some success to the table. Yeah, so for those who don't know, uh, are you are you a full-time career racer? No, I, I mean, I like racing is a full-time job. Uh, of course. The way we do it, we end up working – countless hours in the shop but i'm also uh i'm self-employed i do uh, construction commercial construction very nice very nice now do you find <laughs> do you find it hard to go work on your race car after you've been working through your construction job uh, you know coming home and realizing you got to tear down an entire machine and then rebuild it uh or, or does the passion just fuel you to get in there and get it done uh, the passion fuels you i mean you'll have times every race will tell you where you walk in the shop and there's nothing that can make you do anything to get it done that day. And then there's other days where you just can't wait to get home um, and get the car done. Uh, I'm fortunate. My girlfriend allows me to spend a lot of time in the shop. Uh, she helps me out a lot getting stuff done, keeping stuff organized and everything together. Yeah, having that kind of support is, uh, you know, it's it's you have to have it. You know, if there's any fight back, you're not going to have a very successful race team. No, it comes from everybody. Um, there's no way you could do it yourself. There's so many people that help me out and make all this happen and behind the scenes that really don't 
get credit don't come to the races um i've got neighbors that come over and spend a couple hours a night helping me work on the car and get stuff together when i need a hand and without guys like that it wouldn't happen yeah man that's great that's great so what does this year have entail for you guys you know a, a realistic projection you know obviously you're gonna you want to play place the best you can um where all are you guys going to be racing where can people find you where can people come see you uh, you can find us next weekend at uh, Dirty Turtle Off Road Park uh, for the opening round of the Pro Rock Series okay. um, this year. Um, then the following weekend, we'll actually be down in Windrock. Um, Ultra Four has actually teamed up with SRS this year and started the Titan All-American Off-Road Championship Series. Yeah. Uh, which it'll be four additional races on top of the four or the three East Coast Ultra Four races this year for uh -huh. a combined champion for that series, which is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. So for the that that Titan series, um, is that going to be you know where the you know where those races are going to be? Yeah. Uh, the first race is going to be at Windrock uh, uh -huh. the following weekend after the Pro Rock race. Right. It is. Uh, one second i can tell you the rest of them real okay. quick yeah that'd be great our, our so our, you know between the time of us recording this and the time that this is going to be published it may be about a week so uh dirty turtle hopefully will have happened and hopefully you'll come away and you know by this time next week you'll be uh sitting in first place on the podium yeah that's what we're really hoping uh we're going to give everything we got at that first pro rock race and see if we can bring out a win um from there we got win rock the next weekend and then immediately after that we'll be headed to aop uh april 12th to 13th for the opening round of the east coast ultra four series yeah so you know you've been to aop before correct oh i love aop actually um my only rock bouncing win came at aop that's awesome and uh if i'm not mistaken i was actually at that i have footage of you on my personal instagram uh, going up that, it's kind of that ravine hill, and uh, watching you absolutely just crush it, because uh, that was a uh, that was the first time I think I had um, seen your rig and, and seen it to its full capabilities. Um, but you know, just to sidetrack, you guys are going to be doing, and they're going to be hosting Ultra Four at that park. Um, are they going to be running these rigs all at the same time, or are they going to do corrected time? Um, I'm, they'll end up doing corrected time, but they'll all be on the course at the same time. They usually start us in 30-minute uh, intervals, yeah. or sorry, 30-second increments, and uh, send us out all on course at the same time, and it's overall battle for a corrected time finisher at that, from that point. So for those who haven't been to AOP, which is Adventure Off-Road Park in South Pittsburgh, Tennessee, um, one of my favorite places to go ride, shout out to them, um, they... <laughs> Those trails are not very wide, uh, especially for a full-size rig. Uh, you know, I know the side-by-sides may have a little bit better success there, but uh, I don't see most of the, you know, most of those trails aren't two full-size rigs wide. It's going to be intense. Um, I've been telling everybody, all of my buddies are asking me about the park. They've never been there. Um, I tell them, bring their tires, every tire you got. Um, there's nothing like AOP. Um, that place has more rock than probably any park I've ever been to. And it's rough. And it's rough rock. Um, I compare it to the West Coast guys, you know what I mean? It's like outer limits with mud. Ooh, um, that's, that's a good... never that's, ending. Yeah, you that's... You know, I mean, it's... Go ahead. The traction is none. There's zero traction anywhere. Even the main trail's got little rocks everywhere that you got to watch out for. There's no really any time to take a break at that park. It's good to get a comparison from Outer Limits to what AOP is for the guys who live on the east side. Um, AOP is one of my favorite places to ride, and I actually went up there a couple, uh, it's probably been a little bit over a month now, and I don't know the last time you were there, but uh, things have gotten rough. <laughs> things have been dug out, and uh, I don't know where they're going to be racing, but uh, we can say that if you're going to go, if you can go, you should be there and just watch the race because it's going to be pretty intense. Uh, the The course that I'm, I'm sure that they're running is going to run through some of the hardest trails that park has to offer, and you know it'll be nothing short of a show. Oh, I'm sure um, if we have any sort of rain down there, it's going to be one of the hardest Ultra Four races they've ever had. Um, <laughs> yeah, even I... if it's dry, it's probably going to be one of the hardest four Ultra Four races ever. Um, I've never. We've raced an endurance race there back in the day um, uh, for a little local series, and that was probably one of my funnest races we've ever ran because the challenge at AOP, I mean, it never ends. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, we'll all be looking forward to that, um, and, and I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you know, after the April AOP race, what does that schedule look like? Uh, from there, we head to 
June uh, 14th will be in Davis, Oklahoma for okay. Elder Ultra 4 race. Uh, Your favorite place? Dirty Fertile <laughs> in July. Yeah, my favorite place. Hopefully in June it'll be halfway dry. Yeah, hopefully, right? <laughs> Um, that's what we can hope for. Um, that was some of the worst rain. We were really unfortunate. It rained about nine inches when we were there. Yeah, here in Tennessee, I, I, you know, you say April, that's a little bit of ways for us right now, but if it's anything like the rain we've had this week, it's been, you know, severe flooding, and AOP has not been immune to that, and uh, the rain, <laughs> the rain shows up and it stays around on that mountain specifically. Yeah, that's why that everybody's been calling me. They're wondering what the first race at uh, Dirty Turtle's going to be like. I'm like, well, if it stops raining now, it's not going to help much. It's no. still going to be muddy. Yeah, it's. I mean, y'all y'all best be bringing some boat sides for your rigs because it's going to be uh, it's going to be wet and it's going to be very very thick mud. Yeah, it's going to be nasty. But I, I think you said you had one more. Uh, yeah, we go to uh, in May. Actually, we'll be doing the Pro Rock stuff at Wildcat again. Uh, we'll nice. be there twice this year, and then we go to Winrock in August for more survival racing. Um, and then they also have Race to Riches at Rush uh, again in September. Very nice. Very, very and Race nice. to Riches is one of those events, if you've never been, it's one I definitely highly recommend making it to. They they definitely put on the show. I was about to say, people go out there, and, and it's, it's called Race to Riches, and there's a lot of money on the line there, and you can... You can, let me just say this, you'll see guys really try hard for that money, and they'll, you'll see guys, uh, you know, put everything on the line just for that chance at the money. Yeah, the amount of money that Pro Rock Racing pays out in that weekend is insane. I think they paid out, out around 150000 last Ooh, year. Uh, that's crazy. It was the first year we did survival racing last year. We had 30 UTVs compete for $30,000 Man, um, cash. Man, that's and, wild. That winner took home 15000 for a two-hour race, which was unheard of in the side-by-side -side racing. Well, that, and they also uh, they also put uh, rigs up for the prizes, don't they? Yes, sir. Uh, the top three in the bouncer class and the hill-killing side-by-side class all brought home brand-new Polaris machines. That's just insane. So <laughs> if you're looking to get a new machine, if you have one right now, you think you can climb a hill fast, go out there and get you a new machine. Uh, I'm sure everybody watching would love to see you try. Yeah, the hills at Rush, um, they're big. Yeah, they're, they are. They're big. They are. Well, uh, that's all I had. Um, if you Do you have anything else you want to talk about? No, uh, I think we pretty much covered everything. Make sure everybody gets out this year and come support the races. Um, there's nothing like seeing it live, whether you come to an ultra board race or rock bouncing race. Uh, just make it out to the races and enjoy it in person. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want... Uh, you find any drivers you want to talk to make your way into the pits that's the one thing about the off-road racing uh go find timmy cameron brandon davis shannon campbell um uh, they'll take the time and talk to you um listen to you um, that's the great thing about this sport is everybody is uh there to help out everybody's there to just make it a good time yeah absolutely absolutely so where can people find you on social media how can they get a hold of you uh you can find me on instagram at uh j cantrell 502 um you can follow me on Facebook, James Cantrell. Um, we keep most of the racing stuff updated on Mad Ram 11 on his Instagram, Facebook. Um, we'll be posting some videos throughout the season from GoPro footage and different races to the Mad Ram channel and my personal channel also. Well, that sounds awesome. James, good luck this season, and congratulations on finishing King of the Hammers. And uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, sir. All right, man. Have a good one. You too, buddy.